All right, music ministry. All right, brother, sister, Bowen. Amen. Amen. All right. Catch your breath, sister. Amen. Catch your breath. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for helping us to have this exciting worship experience. Thank you, Reverend Michael Evans, Jr., for preaching last Sunday. Amen. I like that Psalm 23 on your T-shirt there, brother. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Reverend Paulette. Uh, we're praying for you as you mourn and grieve the loss of your grandfather uh, during this season. Where are the prophets? All right. Thank you, ushers. Is a question that I ask on this Memorial Sunday. As we pause and honor and remember those who died in active military service, in order to preserve and protect our rights, our privileges, and our ideals that help to build what America is and what America aspires to be. I ask this question about today's prophets because our sermon scripture out of Numbers chapter 11 written by Moses prompts me to pause, honor, and remember yesteryear's spirit-filled prophets from God, All right. who also gave their lives so that God's word could be promoted and preserved. God also called them to appraise the relationship that his people had with their worship and their living. I suggest to us that we still need God's prophets on this Pentecost Sunday. That's right. That is on our calendar, the Christian calendar, Pentecost Sunday, is the 50th day, the seventh Sunday, after we celebrate Easter or Resurrection. That draws our attention to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, coming to the apostles and Jesus' followers in Acts chapter 2. When the Holy Spirit came, and they were empowered in a supernatural way. On this Pentecost Sunday, when we give attention to the Spirit of God, I believe we still need God's prophets. Our scripture is a record of the journey of God's people in the wilderness. It memorializes who God is, what God can and will do. And God himself says that his power is not limited. Do you think some translations say that God's hand has been shortened? That whatever you are facing today in your life, God is able to do far above what you can imagine or think. This record tells us not only what God does, but what God expects of us and desires from his people as we see through the lens of Moses what he observes about God's people. And in verse 29, Moses raises this comment. 
I wish that all of the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. This was a desire that Moses was expressing about hoping that God's people would speak through God's spirit to one another about their obligations as people in agreement or in covenant with God. The 70 elders of whom you heard read in our scripture were given to Moses to help Moses bear the very difficult burden of leading God's people. We see that it says that God took some of the spirit on Moses and gave it and placed it upon those who were the 70 elders. And once that was done, the word says that they prophesied. There was, if you read the record, there was no message revealed in terms of the content of what they said. And so we understand that it appears as if these prophets prophetically praised God. It was a moment of praising God and they would have declared, true to being prophets, God's will with enthusiasm. That was prompted by what God had said earlier would happen, would happen, even in the face of God's people complaining about their circumstances while they were there in the wilderness, complaining about their lack of food, complaining that although God had provided for them when they were in captivity in Egypt, that now God does not seem to be doing the same thing. That's why he says, do you think my power is limited? Do you think that how I provided when you were in captivity cannot be done now and so then God uses this record to disclose that he has unlimited provision and unlimited power and he says now watch it I'm going to give you the meat that you asked for and it won't be for one day two days three days it will give you a month's supply you see people we not only they we need to trust God and we need to get back on track from wandering from God. That's what this prophet was trying to say to them that you are questioning God, you're having some difficult times, you need to get back and realize the same God who did it once can do it again. And Tracy Mark Stouts reminds us that God's prophets of yesteryear consistently linked right worship with right living, consistently linked idolatry with injustice, and they were reminded that they were God's people, the people of Israel, and they needed to be, respond, to be reminded over and over again of their responsibilities, their duties under the covenant with God. God wanted them to know through the prophets that you might have all of these religious observations or observances, that you might celebrate this and celebrate that, but you need to know it's important how you live Amen. your life, and you cannot separate how you worship with how you live. They are inseparable and our lives and our word must be consistent. The Bible shows us as you study the record, the entire record that God calls specific people as prophets. But we also see that God calls the church as a whole to be prophetic and to be prophets. He speaks through the Apostle Paul and he tells them that we all are prophets. In fact, he says that we, uh, to the church at Corinth, that we must follow the way of God and of love 
And we must eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, prophecy in particular. We must desire to be prophetic as we live our lives. And Paul says those who do prophesy through their prophetic voice, they encourage, they strengthen, and they comfort others because by doing so, they build up the church so that the church can do what it is supposed to do. This then means, my friends, that all people, not just the pastor, not just the preacher, not just the deacons, not just the leaders, but all people are to be prophets in their century. All of God's people are to honor God with a God-honoring life, right worship, and right living, and ought to avoid idolatry and injustice. This is what the prophets are to do. And today, in our chaotic and confused culture, full of conflict and complaints, we need God's spirit-filled prophets. Unfortunately, recent Studies show that seven out of ten Americans say that they view Jesus positively, but they view God's people and the church negatively because of the gap between their vocal worship and their visible living. The problem, my friend, with not having folk in the church is not the message of Jesus, it's the people who are in there. And some of us need to get on board to live the life that we profess with our mouths. Therefore, Kentucky bred Dr. William Augustus Jones Jr. has advised us that our great need is for prophets who love God who hate evil, who espouse righteousness, and preach justice. So I ask, where are the prophets who say what God's spirit gives them? Where are the prophets in the church who testify? Because the Bible here in this passage urges God's people who are filled to be filled with his spirit to speak right words that honor God and that promote God's will as we tune in to what God is doing and what God is saying so we can be assured ourselves of that we know who God is, that we are assured of God's presence, and we are assured of God's power. If you are here today in the sanctuary or online and you're wondering, will God come through? This message is trying to say to you, yes, he will come through. And the chances are, if you look over your life, he's already come through somewhere in the background. Here they were complaining about their circumstance, complaining about their lives in the wilderness, but yet we see in this text that their complaints were replaced with their prophetic praise. They were complaining on the one hand, and it was the kind of praise that praised God ahead of time. They had so much trust in God that they were already declaring the victory. They already believe that even though I don't see it right now, don't understand it right now, that the victory is mine. I may not see how God is going to do it. I may not see how God is going to come out. I may not be clear-eyed about it, but God's going to do it. And because of that, I'm going to prophetically praise him before he even does it. You see, praise flows from your mouth when you are filled with the Spirit. When you're filled with the Spirit of God, that praise will just come out because of who he is, what he's done, and what you are convinced of he will do. You see, it's interesting to me that the English language has 
changed significantly uh, in the 400 plus years since the King James Version was introduced to us. But there is still beauty and a vividness to the Elizabethan English that is part of the King James Version. And one example is 1 Timothy 1 and 6, which speaks about warning about vain uh, jangling. Some translations uh, say rather than vain jangling, they say uh, it's a compound Greek word. It speaks of warning against fruitless discussions, warning against idle talk, warning against meaningless talk, Warning against empty talk and under some circumstances, well, I'll say under any circumstance, when jangling is going on, it's loud. And noisy. And we must be cautious that what we say does not make us noisemakers. Banging and jangling with reckless abandon. Our words, the wise one says in Proverbs, our words hold the power of life and death. The Bible says that everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. The Bible says that too much talk leads to sin So be sensible and keep your mouth shut. The Bible says the one who has knowledge uses words with restraint. In other words, just because you think it doesn't mean you need to say it. Vain, jangling, loud and noisy, disruptive. That's not what we're supposed to be saying. We're supposed to be saying something about how God's power helps us to be and do what he says. The Wizard of Oz has a scene where Dorothy on her road through the land of Oz encounters a talking scarecrow. And uh, they enjoy um, this exchange. Scarecrow says, I haven't gotten, got a brain, just straw. Dorothy says, well, how can you talk if you don't have a brain? The scarecrow says, I don't know, but some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? <laughs> Dorothy said, I guess. <laughs> You're right. I'm, I'm cautioning us to make sure that we are not the scarecrow and think before you speak. Where are the prophets that testify and say what God's spirit gives them? Where are the prophets who show what God's spirit gives them? The Bible here, again, urges his people, God's people, filled with the spirit, to be certain that their lives match their devotion to God. We must show in our surrendered life the truth of God's word, that we can live as God says, that it's not just something that's written, but we can actually live with the spirit, through the spirit of God, the way that the Bible urges us to do. And then God, in turn, releases his power in us because we are his representative, we are his testimonies, and he will show through us to others and to ourselves that we can be what he says we can be. He wants to show us and the world that his ability to provide is not limited. 
That's part of the problem. See, that's, that's the, the issue that the one out of seven Americans have, that we proclaim God is all-powerful. We proclaim that he can do all things, but then in our lives, we don't seem to act like we really believe it. The two prophets in the text, Eldad and Medad, showed God's power because they prophesied. But Joshua, you remember, Moses' assistant, long time, was jealous and complained because they were being prophetic. They were separated from the others, but yet they were prophesying through the spirit that God had given them. And he complained out of jealousy. See, you have to be careful that when you show in your lives what God's spirit allows you to do, there will be people who will be jealous of what you're able to do. And, and you have to just take it and do what God wants you to do. You, you have to show in your life, you are accountable in your life for what God wants you to do. And even if the one next to you, the one behind you, the one in front of you does not have that same kind of ability to show, God has given them something to do. But Moses, when, jo when uh, Joshua comes to Moses, Moses says, are you jealous? I know you're trying to present it as if you think that by them showing their gifts that they somehow take away from my gifts, but are you jealous? And that's when he says, I wish that all of God's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. When I think about this, it's clear to me that Joshua was trying to make lemons out of his situation. He was looking at what was going on in his circumstance and was, was, was projecting some of his own issues. You know, there's a classic cliche that says, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there may be something that you don't know about lemons. Th though they've been around for millennia, they did not occur in nature naturally. Whether lemons are a cross or a hybrid between a bitter orange and uh, what's called a citron, which is a citrus fruit resembling a lemon, but larger with little pulp and a very thick rind. It, the lemon comes from centuries of cultivation and they are the result of plant evolution. All right. Lemons are man-made. Mm. Mm. And since lemons were bred by humans, it could be said that it's not life that gives us lemons, but we make lemons out of life. That what happens oftentimes is a result of our own lemon making. That, that some of the poor attitudes that we have, the jealousies, the uh, uh, choices, the actions that we undertake a part of our lemon making, and rather than saying life has done it, we ought to say that we show that because we have done it. Yeah. Sometimes then we turn our life's circumstances into bitter experiences because of our own actions. Yeah. Come on, come on. So the next time you try to blame life for your problems, you need to take a good look in the mirror because it may not be life that's throwing those circumstances. It might be you. Didn't Pogo say in the cartoon, the enemy is with us and the enemy is us? That's why too many of us do too much ghost fighting. 
We just hit in the air when we ought to be hitting ourselves. We ought to show what the Spirit can do in changing our lives. Lastly, I ask, why don't you not make lemons but make lemonade? Where are the prophets who share what God's Spirit gives them? God's given you something. Where, 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 where are they? The 70 elders shared what God gave them through their prophetic praise. They, they said it, they spoke it, and they were witnessing in such a way that it was clear to those who observed that the Spirit was upon them. When you read what Paul said to the church at Corinth, he says, each believer has received a gift that manifests the Spirit's power and presence, and that gift is given for the good of the community. Each follower of Jesus, each Christian, is a spirit bearer, bearing God's spirit and also God's prophet. You need to ask yourselves, what is the prophetic word that I'm showing, giving, and sharing in my own life? I know you don't want to see yourself as a prophet, but the Bible says you ought to be a prophet. No matter what your gift is, no matter how small you might think your stuff is, no matter how little you might think your talent is, God has given you your gift, your talent to share with others and for the good of others. That's what the Bible says that God has given each of us. Each of us who is a follower of Jesus has been gifted with something that is supernatural from God. You need to get in touch with what that supernatural gift gift is and when you discover what that supernatural gift is you can't hold on it to yourself you've got to be uh, living generously, you've got to live wisely, you've got to use the gifts for others and for the good of your community God's gifts are for sharing not to be behind locked doors I'm afraid that in the church too many of us have locked up our gifts Whatever your spiritual gift is, it was given to you so that it might be shared for the good of others. A few days ago, uh, last week, at the University of Massachusetts Boston campus graduation, uh, billionaire Boston Celtics co-owner Rob Hale surprised 2,500 of their students. Yeah. When he got up, the clip I saw, he spoke to them and said uh, that he was going to gift them with $1,000 each during their graduation ceremony. But then he said, 500 of it is for you, and 500 of it is to give to others. They received to share. Netflix, I hope there are no violators in the house, but Netflix has recently launched its password sharing crackdown in the United States, where there might be those you know <laughs> who share their Netflix login information. So that wherever they are, they can log in. Right. Netflix says, now, if you're caught, you're going to have to get your own account and pay monthly. No sharing any longer of Netflix? How, how are you going to watch your movies? No sharing? But there is a concept called limited good. It means that there is only a limited amount of good to go around. There are some cultures that 
live their lives in that way. They, they have the mindset that to share their belongings, to share their knowledge, to share their love, or even to share their well wishes would be to deplete themselves of that because there's only so much of that that can go around. I wonder how many of us live that way, that we don't share our wisdom, our love, our gifts, our material things, or even our well wishes. Do we even congratulate people? Do we join people? Romans says that when others uh, celebrate, we ought to celebrate with them. Do we even say good job? Do we even say well done? Do, do, do we say how you doing and mean it rather than walking away as we say it? But sharing is about caring. Look what happened. I'm at the end. After they shared through their prophetic praise. Verse 31 says, Now a wind went out from the Lord to these meat complainers. And the wind from the Lord drove quail from the sea, so much so that the quail came, scattered, God did, to about three feet deep around the camp, in the wilderness, right there where they had no meat, right there where they were complaining about how God was not providing for them, right there in their situation and their circumstance. Now, after they prophetically praised God, a wind came through and blew out of semen again. Nowhere, all of these quail said it was so deep, verse 31, that in any direction you walked, you found meat. You complaining about any meat today? You complaining that God is not providing it? Just hold on, prophetically praise God, and he will bring a wind through that will bring from no, no place it would seem, some place you're not even thinking about, somebody you're not even thinking about, some overflow that you might receive, that what you need right now, that God will provide it. And you see, God's people are called to be prophets and to tell somebody that they are able to say and show and share what the Lord will do. You know why they can say what the Lord will do? Because of the, what the Lord has done. done. Oh yeah, because the Lord has already done something. You can say, I know he'll do it again. You can say he brought me from a mighty long way. He'll take me another long way. He got me up out of the valley. He brought me through sickness. He brought me through a bad relationship. He brought me through a bad marriage. If he's done it before, he'll do it again. That's why I can declare God is my protection. God is my all in all. God is my light in darkness. God is my joy in the time of trouble. God is my all in all. God is my today and my tomorrow, just like he was my yesterday. God is the joy and the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God is. He can be whatever you want him to be. I need somebody to understand that whatever you're going through, whatever you need him to be, just declare in the name of Jesus, God is. God is. God is. God is. God is. God is, God is, all that I need, God is, all that I want, God is, God is, God is. Somebody's here today, in the room, in the social media platforms, you know, God has been and God is you know the Bible says he's the same yesterday today and forever don't give up on God because God has not given up on you 
Whatever your report is, whatever you seem to be experiencing now, be a prophet and say and show and share what God has given you through his spirit.